God. Amen, amen. You may be seated. What a great day. Happy Resurrection Day. Merry Easter, happy Easter, or have it works for you. What a great day. I was thinking about this morning, and almost every Easter this thought comes to my mind, is that uh, somewhere in the far, far east as the sun hit the skyline, somebody started praising the Lord this morning. Whether it was in those North Korean communist countries like China or, or further down the line where you get into some of those countries where the Christians are being so persecuted with Iran, Iraq, and Pakistan and some of those places, the underground churches, they were still praising the Lord as the sun broke this morning. And that ripple just kind of carries across the globe, and now it's our turn. Amen? So uh, be counted in all that and rejoice in all that and be a part of what God's doing uh, on this great day as we talk about the greatest event in all of human history, period. Uh, the supernatural power of the cross and the resurrection is pretty much the theme of what I want to talk today about not missing that even more so would be the theme. If we read from Hebrews 2 a while ago, let me just remind you those verses one more time and then make a point or two off that throughout the mess of this, this message today. But he said, this is the reason we must pay closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For the word that was spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken to the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. He said, listen, the message of the gospel has been spoken. Judgment for sin has been taken care of if we're willing to receive what Christ has done for it. But if not, he said, how, 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 how we neglect? I mean, think about this for a moment. In the context of, first of all, history, but in the context of your own personal life. When you look at the Bible, there's this clear picture of God that he has a plan for humanity. In the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden, he had a purpose. He had, there was intent to what God was doing. All right? And just because Adam failed, Eve failed, does not mean that God was stopped in what he was doing. Even then, there was that prophetic message in Genesis where it says, you know, where God's talking about how he's going to deal with this sin issue. He's going to crush the head of the serpent, bruise the heel of the one who crushes the head. Now, that was a prophetic statement from God that, hey, I have a plan in action, and it's going to be carried out. And you see those prophecies spoken and fulfilled all the way up to Jesus Christ and who is the absolute fulfillment of God's plan of redemption, that God and man would once again be reconciled, that a means an avenue, a way would be made, ultimately paved with the blood of Jesus Christ, and we could come to know God, all right? So Easter is this declaration of this glorious power of God, not only to fulfill his purposes, but literally to conquer death and raise Jesus from the dead, set him at his right side, the Bible tells us, and has given him a name above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus, by which every person must be saved. So now God said, this is the plan, this is the way, this is the original intent and in creation to bring you back to me, to have a relationship with me. And then not only does he do that, we who are not capable of suffering for our own sin, dying for our sin and paying the price for it, why? Because this sacrifice has been degraded, it has been, it has been marred by sin. So it, giving myself on the cross would not be acceptable because I'm not an acceptable offering to pay for my own salvation. So God demonstrates how much he loves us. At the same time, how determined he is, he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, that from that sacrifice flows the power to forgive your sins, to erase them off the face of time and history, that you are forgiven as though they had never been committed. That's the power of the cross. And then the power of God to just speak to Jesus to come forth. And he's raised from the dead. Just demonstrating that there's another resurrection day that will come. When all the dead bodies of all the saints who've come to Christ through the centuries. Who those who before the cross looked forward to the cross. Had faith in God for his Messiah. To those who look back to the cross now. Had faith in Jesus our Messiah. Now will be raised from the dead to their glorified bodies for all eternity. Man, there's so much power demonstrated in this message of the cross. This is not dead religion, all right? This is God's demonstration of his love, his mercy, his grace, and his redeeming power to save us. So what he's saying in this passage, you better pay attention. This is your out. Yes. 
<laughs> this, is your, this is your avenue. This is the way. This is what God has desired for your life and what he wants for your life. So that passage gives us some warning, and he uses it in verse 3. Verse 1, he says, you've got to pay careful attention. Verse 3, he says, you don't want to neglect. How should we escape if we neglect? Boy, neglect has been the killer of so many. Uh, you know, everywhere you go in life, there's these little warning signs. My car does them. You know, the car's hot, little warning sign comes, you know. We, we call them idiot lights, right? You know, if you don't pull over and do something, you're an idiot. That's why they call them idiot lights. So for us idiots, these lights come on. They warn us. And I know, I read the manual, that if I don't do something about the light, something's going to happen I don't want to happen. There's going to be a price to pay. Service lights come on in my car. It's a warning. I, I have a smartphone, all right? Some I call it my smart aleck phone. But my smartphone, it has warnings. It'll tell me the battery's getting ready to go dead. If I have my GPS on, you need to turn right here. You know, you want to turn right here, but I don't turn right. I'm going to have to go make a, do some of the detour. So all these warnings are for a purpose to help us avoid some kind of penalty or pain or retribution or recompense or whatever the word you might want to use, the negative aspect of it. Well, God has given you a clear warning, it says here. All right? And God, he said, listen, I, I, you better pay attention. You better pay careful attention not to let this go, not and he use this word, that you do not neglect so great a salvation. Because how in the world will you escape? I mean, the answer, we'll answer again in a moment, but the, it's the last point of my message is, I'll just say it right up front so you have a little preview. You won't. You're not going to escape. So don't neglect, don't, don't you like the way he puts it, so great a salvation, this supernatural grace, the supernatural power of God to redeem us, to set us free, and to make us new. There's about three questions that when I look at a passage like that, that immediately should come to our hearts and mind. And the first question would be something like this. Okay, so great is salvation. Well, what's so great about salvation? I am so glad you asked. I'll ask the question for you if you didn't ask. We shouldn't neglect so great a salvation. Why? First of all, because of the cost of salvation. I mean, we've talked about the, the love of God and sending and abandoning his son on the cross to die for our sin, so much so, he Father, why have you forsaken me? This is the answer, so that you could be saved. The Bible said he didn't like the cross. He abhorred the cross. He didn't, he, 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 he was, he, he, he just, but he went to it anyway because he looked ahead and he saw what would be the result. But the result of your salvation, anybody's salvation, the cost was extremely great. And then just again, it's a demonstration, lest you should not understand it. It is a demonstration of just how much your heavenly Father truly loves you. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, No, love covers a multitude of sins. Well, it was the love of God, for God so loved the world that he gave, that his son was offered as the sacrifice for our sin. What a cost. But not only the cost of salvation, the consequence of salvation. What do you mean? Consequence in a positive sense. Now, the consequences of neglecting are the negative sense. But the consequences of you coming to Christ, put it this way, you have nothing to lose. I love that passage. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, you know, a lot of things people give in exchange for his soul. But if you're, not, if, you're, if you're going to be one of those that I'm not going to exchange my soul for any, I'm giving my heart and soul to Christ, then the benefits to you, well, if you just look through the New Testament alone, there's about 38 plus benefits that you could just quickly write down from the grace of God, the peace of God, forgiveness of sin, blessings of God, acceptance into God's family, sainthood in, in, the, in the glory of God, eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life right now to help you live the Christian life, the, the Word of God, the understanding now of the Word of God that He gives you. I mean, it, the list is just endless of what God does for you. Uh, in your behalf, when you give your heart and your life to Christ Jesus. I mean, if you're looking at a trade kind of thing, you know, you're trying to think of the, uh, the economics here, uh, it's, a, it's a bad deal for God and a great deal for you. You know, you ever bought a car and walked by and said, I got a really good deal. Hey, you come to this, day, you got a really good deal. You had nothing to offer and gained everything. How can you beat that? The consequences, but not only the consequences, let's look at the consummation of salvation. So great a... Uh, salvation. What does that mean? That means that I, I come to Christ, I repent of my sin, I open my heart and life to him, and he, he makes me right. We call that justification. I'm made right with God. I'm going to use the terminology, just if I had never sinned. Justified. I've been made right with God. But not only that, the Holy Spirit now lives in my life and continues to make my life deeper, more meaningful, and even more abundant. 
I have an acknowledgement now by the Holy Spirit that I'm God's child. I have a witness from the Holy Spirit that I belong to God. He also gives me witness by the fact if I'm not right with him, he convicts and convinces me. He, he, he brings me to a place of going deeper with God. Now, the theological term for that going deeper is sanctified. I'm being sanctified. The ultimate of our salvation is experienced when we we stand in the very presence of God, resurrected, either resurrected or raptured. <clears throat> we stand in the presence of God with completely whole new bodies, glorified bodies. And that's a whole other sermon. You can go back and listen to my series on, 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 on the end times a few months ago where we talked about heaven and what that really means and what a glorified body is really all like. But ultimately, it's heaven for all eternity. You're not sitting around strumming harps on clouds. That's such a, a, a sorry view of heaven. The Bible says we're going to reign with, the, with God. The Bible says we will even judge the angels. In other words, we're going to have a, this incredible authority in all of eternity for the glory of God. And it's going to be a time which, which uh, our, as Paul said, which it's, we only can see through a glass darkly at it. But why is salvation so great? Well, there's three things. But let me show you the fourth thing why I think salvation is so great. Because of the conditions. It doesn't cost you anything. It, it, it's, it's a free gift of God. Listen to what Acts 16, he's talking, and I preached on this a few weeks ago, and the, this is Paul speaking to that Philippian jailer. He says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He didn't say, believe and do certain pillars of faith, <laughs> and you'll be saved, or believe and learn certain meditational styles, and you'll be saved. Believe and then reincarnate and be something a little better in your next life, and then uh, try a little better in your next life, but if you're not so good, we're going to demote you to a fly or a cow or something. No, it's not that. It's not believe and go through rituals and routines and, and check certain boxes off every day and walk just in a certain way and dress a certain way and act a certain way and look a certain way. No, it's believe and receive. It is the free gift of God. Yes, I come to him and I turn my heart and my life over to him, but that's a good deal. That's, a, that's, that's quite, quite the bargain, so to say. It doesn't get any better than that. So this is why salvation is so great. You've heard me mention before Dr. J. Sidlow Baxter. I've got several of his books, but he has this one devotional book. And I, I looked at what he had to say in this particular passage. And let me just read a little bit of this from you. He, he says, why is salvation so great? First, he says, a salvation which necessitated the incarnation and the humiliation, the hungering and the thirsting, the testing and the tempting, the tears and the groans, the shame and outpoured blood of his own divine son, must be a great salvation. For if there had been any other way, God never would have affected it to such an awful, unspeakable cost. He went on to say the second reason, salvation is so great, a salvation which brings me and tens of millions of others and rescues us from sinship, both legally and morally, a salvation which in its judicial provisions delivers me from the guilt and the penalty of multiplied transgressions against God's holy law delivers me from the wrath to come, from the judgment of the great white throne, from the fearful flame of Gehenna, a salvation which in its moral provisions brings me regeneration by the divine spirit, reconciliation with God, inward cleansing, sanctification, fellowship with God, present victory over hereditary perversity, and eventual deliverance from every trace of it, the promise of heaven at last, and a perfect rapture in the presence of God through endless ages, surely a salvation which brings all that to millions and millions of us could have been procured by nothing less than the infinite cost of Calvary. That's why our salvation is so great. And I know that we all have friends and family and people that we know, we pray for, we love, we care about, we witness to, and they know the information They've been told this information. You've shared the good news. But yet, for some reason, they have neglected so great a salvation. They haven't. It's like a man drowning in the ocean. And when the rescue boat pulls up, he knows he can be saved just by simply getting in the boat. Refuses to do so. How shall we escape? We have all the facts and, all the, and people rejoice in the fact that they have the information, but they've never experienced the transforming power of God in their life. So great is salvation. Now, the second question would arise would be this. Why is there such a risk of neglect? Why is there such a risk? In other words, 
We need to hear the word of God and then we need to respond to the word of God when we hear the word of God. He says, listen, how will you escape? Now, I think we need to consider several things. People think thinking about death only, but let me, let me think about this one for a moment. I believe we risk the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us very clearly in, in, in these prophetic passages of the New Testament, there's going to come a day when the world reaches the ultimate, you know, the cup is full of wickedness. And that God is going to judge the earth and the nations. And there's going to be this seven-year time of judgment. But it says in Revelation, I will not allow my people to experience that tribulation, that judgment that's going to come on the earth. And so what he's going to do, he says, Paul said, he's going to come and he's going to appear like a thief in the night and take those who know the Lord away in an instant. It says the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who believe who are alive will go second and we're caught up in the air to be with the Lord and we go. And at that point, all hell, somewhere in the next days, weeks, or month, or year, I believe, it's going to be that close. But just prior to this tribulation of seven years of Jacob's trouble, seven years of hell on earth, the Lord comes and receives the church. It's like it's God sent judgment on the earth and delivered an ark for God's righteous people to be saved in it. Jesus is that ark in, in that great moment for us. And he delivers. And any person who's just sitting around with information but not yet committed their heart and life to Christ, the Bible says they're going to miss this glorious opportunity. And here's, here's the tragedy. for Here's what happens when people know some of the Bible. It, it, it becomes even more dangerous. Because I've heard people say, well, yeah, but I think that if the rapture comes and I don't give my life to Jesus, that great time when he comes and takes the saints off the earth before the tribulation, well, I'll just give my life during the tribulation. The Bible says anybody who comes to Christ during the tribulation will die as a result of their choice for Jesus Christ. They'll be hunted down and beheaded according to what the Bible teaches us. And if that seems bizarre to you, that is already taking place in the world today, by the way. There are millions of Christians who live in such persecution and face death every day for, the, for, for Christ. But this is going to be global at this point. And in fact, let's say, let's say you're that person... Paul wrote the church said, listen, you need to be, understand this. He said, you know, that there's going to come a time when I'm going to send, a, a, the, a, the God said through Paul, a strong delusion so that people are going to believe a lie. He says, and those who knew it and didn't respond to it will be the first to be deceived in that strong delusion. So it's a danger of just realizing that we're so close. I think most people, even people who don't know God, know that the world's on the edge of tremendous turmoil. The whole world's in confusion. The whole, the whole world's in chaos. And it's, it's like at no other time in history. And it, it, we need to realize the day and the age at which we're in is what the Bible describes as end times. You say, well, they've been saying that for 2,000 years. But never has it been as it is today and never has so much Bible prophecy been fulfilled as it has been up to today. In fact, there's not a, lot, a whole lot of prophecy left to be fulfilled except the rapture and the tribulation. Those are about the last two events to take place. All right? And so we need to realize that if you know Christ, about Christ, but don't really know Jesus, have not given your heart to him, you need to quit putting this off because Jesus made it clear, hey, uh, it's going to happen. All of Matthew 24, the Lord talks about this in, in 24, 36. Says, you don't know the hour. No man knows the hour of the Father. But he did tell us in Matthew 24 that we could know the seasons. We know the seasons. We know when, when, when summer's here, the heat. We know when fall is here, the leaves are falling. We know when winter's here, it's cold. We know when spring's coming, it's raining. The flowers are blooming. The grass is turning green. You can, you can determine the seasons. We need to understand the seasons of the Lord before us today and get our hearts and our lives right with God. He went on to say, hey, you, may, you don't know the hour. He said, but I'll tell you one thing. You better be ready. But it's going to be an hour when you think not the Son of Man comes. Let me prove a point. How many actually believe before this service is over that Jesus will come? Don't raise your hand because you'd be lying. <laughs> no, I don't be there. That means it could be today. <laughs> that means it could happen now. In this instant. Because we're living in that day. When the world just laughs and scoffs and ridicules, oh, this is ridiculous, but it's going to happen. Another reason you don't neglect it is because you don't know when you're going to draw your last breath. In Hebrews 9, 27, it's a point under man wants to die. I saw what was the Powerball thing up to the last week. I saw some numbers on the news, and it's like 400 and something. Is it million? Billion? I don't even know anymore. It's a lot of money, right? 
And they showed all these people in line at the, at, the, at the store, scratching their numbers and doing all that stuff, and, you know, just feverishly wanting to win. Hey, your odds of winning that are about one in 400 million. I hate to break it to you. About one in 400 million. What are your odds of dying? One in one. <laughs> I know, not, I know it's Easter, we're supposed to be happy, but you're going to die. All right. I'm going to die. I've said it before. You know, they're going to have a service for us. There might be, you know, a little box up here where they stick our body in and put some flowers around it, but you're dead. All right. It may look pretty. People are going to come by and look at you. We might cry and we'll moan. And we'll, 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 we'll be grieving over our loss of you, but they're going to go back when the service is over to the fellowship hall. They're going to eat chicken and potato salad and go home. All right, you're going to die. You don't want to have missed this in your life. But it could happen at any instance. Then there's no guarantee that we live to a certain old age. But there's the one appointment that we will not miss, and that's this one. Another problem why we don't want to risk this and put this off is our heart can become hard. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about not putting this off. In Hebrews chapter 3, I only listed a couple of verses, but there's about three or four verses in Hebrews 3 where it says, today, today, today. If you hear his voice, the Holy Ghost is speaking. If you hear his voice, then respond to it today. Hebrews 3, 15, while it said today, you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't, don't provoke God, is what it says, as in provocation. You know, why, why would that provoke God? Because God's given everything for you. He gave his son on the cross. I mean, isn't that a demonstration of just how much he really loves us? So don't, 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 don't provoke God. And, and he repeats it in verse 315. To David hears voice, don't harden your heart. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7. Again, he says, he limits it to a certain day, saying to David, today, after so long as a time, as it said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I grew up around the gospel message. But I hardened my heart. I was very tender at a young age as a child. I even kind of, I felt really bad that I was going to go to hell, so I got baptized. But I never really committed my life to Christ. I never really chose Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I just kept putting it off. When I got through high school, there were times where the, I really know that the Lord was dealing with me. But the more that God dealt with me and the more I put it off, the less intense that conviction was, that, that speaking to my heart. You know, I kept putting it off and putting it aside, and it was just it was getting more diminished every time. Now, I know I've shared this illustration, but uh, I grew up in West Texas, and I had a cousin and a grandmother who had a ranch, big ranch out there. And uh, some summers, we'd go out there and work on the ranch, uh, whether it was baling hay and lifting, you know, these, those were fun, those 75-pound bales stacking in the heat of West Texas weather, whether that or dipping sheep or shearing sheep, or, and sometimes we'd brand cattle. they bring these calves in, and they brand these calves with a ranch brand. Of course, you, you've seen that before. They take the hot iron, you know, and get it glowing red hot, and they apply it to that calf's hip there, and that lead out there, and that calf just screams, it's, you know, it's just making all kinds of racket screaming. Sometimes we have to rebrand a cow that the brand was diminishing. And they'd bring that cow in, that calf in, and they, uh, they would lay that cow down, and we would take that hot iron and put it right over the same place it had been before. Now, it, yeah, but not near as much as before because all that tissue was dead. Uh, that first branding had seared it. And it's possible for our conscience to become seared. I personally believe in my own life. The night I gave my, li my life to Jesus, it was really clear to me it's now or never. You know, it's just now or never. And, and Scripture warns you this. It, Jesus when he's talking to his disciples, this is the night that he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he rests him. Before they get there, he's speaking to them, John 16, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to have a work in ministry. He, he's going to come and he's going to reprove or correct the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they don't believe on me. Of righteousness because I'm, I go to the Father. They see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. What's he saying here? The Holy Spirit's going to come. I'm not going to be here. But he's going to do what I did because when I was here, my life, because it was so pure, what, this is basically the context of it, because I was light and life and righteous, men were darkness, my life was offensive to a lot of people. And Jesus is offensive to a lot of people. My life would offend. That's why, the, that's why the scribes and the Pharisees and all their false religion hated him so much because his life offended them. He was light. They were darkness. He says, so I'm going to go. And the Holy Spirit, he's going to, he's going to teach you about sin and righteousness and judgment. I'm not, but he's going to do this. 
Okay. The life of Jesus, can you imagine what, that, what would that have been like growing up with Jesus, all right? There's Jesus. He's your big brother. He never does anything wrong. <laughs> Remember, some of y'all have brothers and sisters. Like, you know they did wrong. They just never got caught for some reason, right? How many had some family members? Don't, maybe they're with you. They don't raise your hand. But, <laughs> but you're thinking, you're kind of looking at them. Oh, little Mr. Perfect, a little Mr. Perfect. You know, they never did anything wrong mama's eyes. Well, that was Jesus because he was Mr. Perfect. But his life was a statement. So what now the Holy Spirit comes and he convicts us, hey, you're not right with your father. You, you're out, you're, you need to get in the family. You need to get your heart right with God. You need to repent and turn your life over to Christ and follow him. That's what he does. He reproves us. He corrects us is what it means. But what happens if we don't respond to that? We get harder. In Genesis 6, the Lord says this, you know, my spirit will not always strive with man. All right, this is the time of the judgment. He gives an opportunity for deliverance. Noah preaches, the Bible says. As he builds the ark, his, his, his message is judgment's come. But nobody wants to respond. They ridicule and they laugh. But then judgment comes. And God says in the context of that, I'm not going to always strive with you. you. You need to make a decision. The real warning is there in Proverbs 27 when it says, Do not boast yourself about tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. You may not see tomorrow night. You may not see tomorrow morning. I don't know. He says, so there's this risk. There's this tremendous risk, you know, of just becoming hardened. So that when God does speak, it doesn't, doesn't bother you anymore. It doesn't stir you anymore. That's a hard and horrible place to come to in your life. The third question to me, or the, the, the fourth reason to me that arises out of this, why we don't want to neglect this is, is the risk of losing ultimately our soul in hell. Mark 8 puts it pretty clearly. What will it profit a man if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? Our world is not concerned with our soul. Our world, at least in this part of the world, is more concerned with gain. We want prestige. We want prominence. We want popularity. We want power. We want profit. You know, it all comes from one place, our pride. But what if you gain everything in this world, but you die and when you go to the grave, you take nothing with you. I mean, they may put you on a, on a suit, but when you step in the presence of God, naked you came in, naked you go out. The suit doesn't go. And I praise God that when I gave my life to Jesus, I got me a suit called a robe of righteousness. So when I stand before God, I don't have to be ashamed. I'm clothed in his presence with his own righteousness. But there's this terrible risk that every one of us face, no matter how we don't want to think about it or talk about it, that's a reality. Which ultimately is that third question that arises from this, how will you escape? You will not. You won't. You have to realize there's just there's no other alternative. There's, there's no, there's no do-overs. You, you don't reincarnate and get to come back as something else and, and, and try to do it a little better. When you lose here, you lose forever. It's not like you're in a tournament where you can take another seed and come up a little light, maybe make a final four, whatever. It doesn't work that way. Try again next season. There is no next season. The Bible says to be absent from the bodies to be in the presence of the Lord. As we said a while ago, it's appointed a man wants to die and then the judgment. I've shared the story that C.H. Spurgeon tells about demons meeting in hell. No, it's not in the Bible, so don't go looking for it in your concordance. It's just an illustration. He said there was this meeting that Satan called his major chief demons to the table. And they began to discuss how can we further drag people into hell. Let me hear from you guys what your thoughts are. First demon raises his hand and said, I got an idea. <coughs> Let's tell him there is no God. You been drinking out of this, Gary? Okay. <laughs> the cup of communion. Just tell him there's no God. The devil kind of shakes his hand approving. Yeah, but, you know, uh, there's some discussion. Next demon, I, 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 I have it. Let's just tell them that Jesus, now he was born, but he's not really the son of God. That's, that's just fabricated. A little approval in the crowd, a little rumble still, some more discussion. Fourth demon stands up and says, let's just tell them. Very simply, there is no heaven. There is no hell. We can even get a song. Imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> This, this time there's really no, no heaven, no hell but below us, you know. It's just, just no eternity. We just go into non-existence. 
a little bit of approval there as well. Until the fifth demon says, I've got it. It's brilliant. Tell them every bit of it's true, but there's no need to hurry. I think Satan's greatest method for damning souls to hell is that lie right there. There's no, no need to get in a rush over this. Some other time, hey, you know, let me get past prom. I'm a senior. <laughs> let me get through this. That's college. You know, I got to my party years. I got to live my party years. Let me get through that and then maybe. Oh, I'm now into business. I get past business and I get, the, you know, so I, got, I don't want to embarrass myself with my business patrons and partners and, and, and consumers and customers. So let, me, let me just put that off for a little bit longer. How will you escape if you neglect? You won't. There was a story It was given. It's an actual story about a guy named George Wilson in 1830. In 1830, George Wilson robbed the U.S. mail, apparently of a lot, so much so that he was convicted and sentenced, and the sentence to be carried out that he was to be hung. Andrew Jackson was the president back in 1830, and he decided he would issue a pardon for George Wilson. And it was presented to George Wilson for whatever reason. That's why I think about some people and they reject Jesus. For whatever reason, he denied and refused to accept it. Well, that wasn't good enough for Andrew Jackson. He took it all the way to the Supreme Court. That this man would have to be set free and not, and, and not hung, that not be executed. But it was Chief Justice Marshall, the Supreme Court at that time, who concluded that Wilson had to be, would have to be executed. And his statement was something like this. A pardon is just a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If George Wilson refuses, it's no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God was offered as your pardon for your sin. And you can receive him or you can reject him. But the pardon is there. And just like George Wilson, the value of that pardon that's being presented to you is determined by your acceptance upon it. Now, in itself, the value of Jesus is unbelievably rich and full and powerful. But you have this responsibility. What if we just had time today, and I'm not going to do this, but for me to stand at that door... And to hold this Bible out as each person stops one at a time before me just to look at you and I and say, hey, have you received the pardon that's offered to you? Or you just know about it and you're neglecting it? What would be your answer? How would you respond to that? Not what you, what you would like. Well, you know, I believe God. I've been saved. No, no, you know. no but what, you know what's really going on in your heart. And so does the Holy Spirit, by the way. He knows exactly where you're at. And he knows exactly what your excuses have been. Not so many years ago, I did a, a funeral for an uncle of mine who committed suicide. And that's tough. When you lose somebody, and some of you may in this room have experienced that, losing family members to suicide. I said before, there's probably nothing more selfish that a person can do than commit suicide. It's sad we don't know the grief and the sorrow and the heart of people who get to that place of despair in their life. But that's always the wrong decision. Reach out. The presence of God is available. But I thought that many times, how many people that I do know, besides somebody like an uncle in my family, how many people I just know in life who are committing a spiritual suicide by not doing what they know that they should do, receive Jesus Christ? Every one of us have to face this decision. And I'm probably speaking to a group of people this is not the first time you've heard the gospel. Even if you're a visitor today, you, God probably spoke to you on other occasions if you don't know him. And even for those who do know him, your heart and life not really right, you know the voice of God. The best offer that you will ever get is this one that the Lord offers you to receive and to believe. Today, I encourage you, if you hear his voice, do not put this off. If you're a Christian, you know your life's not really right with God. Do you think what you're exchanging that place of peace with God for, do you think that's really worth it? In the long term of eternity, 
It may offer you some kind of present kind of pseudo peace, but it's not really the answer and you know it. Why don't you lay that down? Because the power, the glorious, majestic, incredible, overwhelming, glorious power of God is available to everyone who will reach out to receive it. The power to save you, the power to redeem you, the power to set you free. Millions upon millions have come to Christ over the centuries. And millions upon millions throughout all eternity will be given testimony of the tremendous power of God's redeeming grace. Will you be among that group? If you do know the Lord, make sure your heart is right with God. If you don't, if you've never made a decision, you may be thinking, well, just how does that work, Pastor? It's a choice. It's a simple decision that only you can make. I had to make it in my own life. Am I going to continue to live my way, do my thing, let me be the ruler of my life, which kept leading to more miserable life after the next step after another step, or am I going to really let Christ take control and discover what I mentioned at the very beginning, this glorious, tremendous plan of God that was fulfilled completely and now made available to us? Am I going to discover that and get in line and follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Faith, faith is simply belief and repentance, surrendered heart, change of mind. It means a change of direction. If you've not done that, then you miss the grace of God. You miss the greatest event in all of human history and its design. What will you do with Jesus today? You know, if we look at the end days of Jesus, but it, the crucifixion and the horrible sufferings and the beatings he went to. Uh, I'm reminded often of where Pilate is sitting there, asked for that bowl of water to wash his hands and said, I'll not be guilty. Hey, everybody's guilty of the innocent blood of Jesus being sacrificed. It was our sin that took Jesus to the cross. So yes, the blood is on our hands. And the only thing that washes it off, the guilt, is the blood of Jesus. Surrendering your life to Christ. Today, you can make that decision right there where you're seated right now in this moment. Say, Lord, here's my life. Thank you for dying for me. I choose you over me today. I'm following you. That's the beauty, the simplicity of it. And here's, here's what even gets better. In that moment of real surrender, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Jesus said, if you have not the Holy Spirit, you're none of mine. So when you give your life to Christ, he comes in. And he'll give you the power, the strength that you need to live for him if you'll keep following him. All too often we abandon. Get back in. Follow Christ. Discover his will and purposes for your life. They're much better than yours and whatever's on your list. Trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. And I say this very clearly because I know many of you here, you're here Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, but I ask you today, do you, have you ever come to this place to really give your life to Jesus or do you just join the church? You're just trying to be better. I remember days before I, I gave my life to Christ when the Lord was really convicting me and I was kind of looking back over my life and my religious experiences. Y'all have some of those, right? But as I examined, I never saw one of them that really, I really made a choice to turn away from myself. Oh, I'll do a little better, turn over a new leaf, that kind of stuff, you know. I'll get baptized. I'll go to church. I'll be a better boy. I, didn't need, I just need to come to cross and say I'm nothing. Forgive me my sin. I'll follow you. That's when God effected a change in my heart. That can happen in your life today. That's why we give an invitation in our church. In fact, the band, you can come now. As they come, get in place this morning. As Crystal sees you're ready, start singing. Let's start worshiping the Lord this morning. Because you're in a place today and you're in an environment today where there's tremendous liberty to give your heart to Christ. You're not living in some country where someone stands ready with a sword if you're ready to commit your heart to Jesus and they even cut your head off. You're standing in a place today by the grace of God to be here in the house of God where the people of God are praying and rejoicing and trusting and lifting you up to the Lord. So Pastor Gary's going to come. I'll be standing here. If we're busy, then some of the elders or deacons will come and pray with somebody else that may be standing in line. You pay attention, guys, what's going on. But this morning, you can come and give your life to Christ and have a brand new heart and a brand new life. But the Bible says we believe with our heart, but it also says that we confess with our mouth. Make a decision and a public decision. You say, why do you get public invitation? Because, and you've seen Billy Graham and others do that in church. Because the Bible says, you know, we, we, we're to confess Christ openly. So it's your chance to come and confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said, if you want to confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. You're ashamed of me. I'll be ashamed of you. 
because the price has been paid and it's a great price. So let's stand with your heads bowed and your hearts open to the Lord. If you've never given your life to Christ, right there where you're standing, you say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I can't do this. I need you. Give me your spirit today. I choose you as my Lord and Savior. And as you pray that, when we begin to sing the moment, you come out and slip out and come take Pastor here and myself. And say, Listen, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Maybe you're here today as a Christian. You know things have not been right with God. And you're here to, why don't you come find a place between you and the Lord? This altar is a holy place today. We just come and do business with the Lord Jesus. He's your, he's your mediator. He's your high priest. Just come and pour your heart out to the Lord. And just get, it, get right with God today. Maybe you're looking for a church home. And you know this is where the Lord's been leading you. Quit putting that off. Come get on board to what God is doing. Get involved in what God's up to in these days that he's given us. Father, we love you today. I know that you know every one of our hearts and our lives. I ask you in Jesus' name to continue that work of conviction in each of us, Lord, to draw us closer to you. That today, this day of resurrection celebration, we can see a new resurrection in our own life of your power and grace. In Jesus' name, you come. Open your heart to the Lord. Worship, sing, find a place at the altar. However the Lord leads. Let's trust the Lord today. Wow.